I mean, fuck. I would never want to think that I would ever emotionally manipulate people. Like, I really, really don't. apologize for what happened over the last week I was being unreasonable and um freaked out because I was jealous I get I lied about going back to Nader it's gonna just find some other broad and try to fucking make me jealous It's not my problem, right? Who cares, right? Yeah, right. I just can't believe this is happening. A delusion is a fixed false belief. And despite evidence that goes against what you believe, you still believe it. So it's what we called a tightly held belief. Delusions can be a part of other psychotic experiences like mania, depression, and substance intoxication or withdrawal. A fucking conspiracy here. There are six types of delusions and delusional disorder. First, there's erotomanic type. This is when you believe that someone is in love with you. And we sometimes see this kind of delusion in people who stalk. They're following or contacting the person because they believe the person wants their contact. And the person on the other end is creeped out by it and doesn't understand why the stalker won't just leave them alone. People are fucking idiots. The main criteria for a delusional disorder is that you have a delusion that lasts at least one month. And there are certain personality disorders where people can experience very short-term psychotic experiences that last minutes to hours. And you can see this with paranoid personality disorder what? and borderline personality disorder. Mm -hmm. I want to put lipstick on. Actually, I want to go to bed. Now, not every stalker is delusional, but some can be. Next is grandiose type. With this delusion, you believe that you have a great talent or insight that people just haven't discovered yet. But regardless, regardless, regardless of that. And since it doesn't make you globally psychotic and out of touch, many people will just keep to themselves about their beliefs to reduce conflict <coughs> and get people off their back about getting help. That's not my point, regardless. In my experience, delusional disorder is not as responsive to antipsychotic medication. If the disorder doesn't cause a lot of dysfunction, you may not even go to get help or accept that you need to take something to stop believing what you do. Ah. So it's something people can live with without seeking help. Sometimes the intensity of the belief can come and go such that you get less focused on it. Then under stress, the thoughts can ramp up again. So that's delusional disorder. There's so many other reasons, so don't worry about it. Subclinical psychosis is a term that some researchers have used to describe psychotic symptoms in people who don't have a primary psychotic illness or as a way to identify people who are prone to later get a psychotic illness. It's not really meant to describe a situation where you're just a little bit psychotic. Practically speaking, psychosis is binary. It's like a switch that's on or off. Oh my God, you guys are driving me nuts. You either are or you're not, but you're not a little bit. That said, there is a concept of psychosis spectrum, which is different, so let me explain. Psychotic symptoms fall into five categories. Hallucinations, delusions, disorganized thinking, which shows up as disorganized speech, Sorry. abnormal or disorganized behavior, and negative symptoms. These are the five psychotic domains. I don't have, I have them all blocked, but... 
Depression and mania can cause you to have isolated psychotic experiences like hearing voices or being delusional. You can also have hallucinations if you're intoxicated from a drug or take a medication like prednisone or morphine. But psychosis from these other conditions tend to be transient, meaning temporary and they're on the light end of the psychosis gradient. Even if you have symptoms in two domains, the symptoms don't last like they do with the schizophrenia spectrum illness. An example of this is becoming severely depressed and psychotic. In that state, you may have delusions, like someone's trying to break into your home, and you may hear someone calling your name. That's two domains. But you can slip in and out of having those symptoms, and they're not a permanent part of your condition. And... Oh. Watch obsessively somebody else. As your depression improves, those symptoms go away. Because of this temporary come and go nature, psychotic depression is not a schizophrenia spectrum illness. People with borderline personality disorder can have transient psychotic episodes under stress. In fact, this is where the Jeez, term puffs. borderline came from. It refers to a character organization that's on the border between neurotic and psychotic. Neurotic is a proneness to negative emotions like depression and anxiety. Psychotic organization is a proneness toward disorganized behavior that causes serious functional impairment. Like, I don't get... <sighs> One more symptom that can feel like psychosis and open. make you think that maybe you're a little bit psychotic, and that is dissociation. Dissociation is a mental state where you feel disconnected from yourself or your environment. Mine explode. <sighs> In this state, you can feel out of body. You can mentally check out when you get anxious. You could have trouble remembering events. Or you can even have sensory experiences like hearing yes. things or feeling or seeing things that aren't yeah. present at the time. Go ahead. They would have to prove it. These sensory experiences aren't considered psychosis because they're related to how your mind is retrieving memories. With hallucinations that come from a psychotic state, your brain is creating false information. But despite the differences in the biological origins, the dissociative experience can feel very similar to a psychotic episode. So you can think of dissociation as a cousin of psychosis. Dissociation is also considered a primitive defense mechanism that you can use to take unacceptable thoughts and impulses and tuck them away in your mind out of your awareness. And this is an automatic process that you can't control. If you do this a lot, you can have trouble feeling connected to reality and yourself, and you may have chunks of time that you can't account for. Feeling like this can be very distressing but you're not considered to be psychotic. Imagine that. Honestly, go ahead. In its most basic form, narcissism, as we use the term today, is neither good nor bad. It's on a spectrum of healthy to pathological. Healthy narcissism is the ability to take pleasure in yourself and your accomplishments. You develop a healthy level of narcissism in childhood when you have parents who allow you the freedom to form your own opinions and express your most vulnerable emotions in a supportive environment without criticism and shame. Narcissism has several facets to it. Here are some of the terms you've probably already heard. Narcissism, pathological narcissism, malignant narcissism, narcissistic personality disorder, narcissistic vulnerability, narcissistic injury, and narcissistic abuse. Narcissism is not a diagnosis, it's a psychological concept that helps explain or define human behavior. Another term for this is a psychological construct. Narcissism is defined as love of the self. Pathological narcissism moves down the continuum in the direction of overinflating your self-worth and doing things that are exclusively for your self-gratification and often to the detriment of others. Spaghetti? Oh my God, sorry, I'm so fucking sorry. For some people, this can look like the need to take from people to feel a gain. You tear people down to feel built up. Someone else's win is experienced as a loss for you. Behind the pathological narcissism is a perpetual need to fill your cup because it always seems to be empty. Everything is weighed against, what about me? 
You may be wounded in this area of self-love. If you don't love yourself enough, you become vulnerable to being in or creating unhealthy relationships. They're seriously giving me shit? There's not one thing that causes pathological narcissism, but it can stem from someone who is so starved for validation and affirmation that they work to get their needs met at all costs. But their needs are never satisfied. But I don't know his password. Pathological lying. What it is and how it compares to normal lying. There isn't an established official definition for pathological lying because it's not considered a mental disorder. Instead, it's observed as a behavioral disturbance that's present inside of other disorders like some personality disorders like antisocial personality disorder and some brain disorders like Korsakoff syndrome, which is brain damage from alcohol. No. Pathological lying used to be called pseudologia fantastica. I like saying that. And it referred to people who told multiple outrageous lies that would border on the fantastic. And those were more than just simple lies. These would include elaborate details that seem questionably believable. And when you challenge the person on the details, they tell even more lies to make the story work. It's fucking true. The motive behind the lying wasn't always clear, and sometimes it was just to impress people. Now, there is a body of research on deception. Most of the early work was when, within a forensic context, usually looking at people who have committed crimes. But the more recent research has focused on non-criminal settings. And of that research, there has come this understanding of deception. Lying is defined as the deliberate attempt to get someone to believe something that you know is not true. Um, oh, I hate this shit. And there's three types of lying. Normal, prolific, and pathological. Pathological lying is still seen as a different entity that takes lying to a different level. But normal lying and prolific lying were considered behaviors that were non-pathological. Yes. Yes, yes, yes. On average, normal everyday lying was telling one to two little lies a day and one big lie a week. Prolific lying was telling six little lies and three big lies in one day. That's a lot of deception. Pathological lying is more compulsive and the lies don't have a clear motive or benefit. It can seem like lying for the sake of lying. Some people start to believe their lies and have trouble even knowing what the truth is. When that happens, it's pointless to challenge the person on their lies because they may have gotten so lost in the lies that they can't even dig their way out. Oh my God. I'm going to laugh with my friends after. Because pathological lying has been poorly researched, we don't have a good treatment protocol for it. There's therapy to help increase the person's insight into their lies and identify what triggers the behavior and even help the person recognize that they're getting into a lying loop. Believe it or not, for some people, it can become like ordinary talk and they don't even see themselves as spinning a lot of lies. They, can, they just see it as talking, like storytelling. And what's wrong with storytelling? So for that person, it could be helpful to help them recognize that their storytelling is harmful to others and themselves. If you treat the lying like a compulsion where the person becomes very anxious if they don't lie or uses the lies to compensate for some obsessional thinking that they have, then it's possible that they may experience some improvement from taking an antidepressant similar to what we use for treating obsessive compulsive disorder. So that's pathological lying. I'm going to bed soon.